Welcome everybody. My name is Maika Burke. I work in the culture and press section of the German Embassy in Ottawa, and it is my pleasure to introduce Christine Fortwängler, the head of the culture and press department of the German Embassy in Ottawa. Before I hand the word over to her, I'd like to just remind everybody to please keep yourself muted. We will have an opportunity to ask Melanie Rabe questions later on in the second part of this call. And if uh, you do not want to unmute yourself for that and you would rather uh, put your question in the chat, please feel free to do so. We will be monitoring the chat for those questions in the Q&A portion. So without any further ado, I would love to hand the word over to Christine Fortwängler. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maika. My name is Christine Fortwängler, and before starting the conversation, I would just like to say that um, on this very difficult day, um, our thoughts go out to the people of, of Ukraine in these very difficult times. And I know it's, it is, um, having said this, and it's on everybody's mind, I'm sure, uh, the difficult situation. It's very fine. It's very difficult to find a good transition. However, as Micah just said, celebrating uh, Black History Month is a very important topic as well. And I'll just uh, like to start doing it. Fe uh, February is Black History Month here in Canada, not only here in Canada, but in Canada as well. And it's uh, Black History Month is a month dedicated to showcasing and highlighting the contributions um, by black uh, citizens to society, to literature, to all things of life. The German Embassy in Ottawa is very happy, therefore, to introduce um, Canadians to Melanie Rabe, a German podcaster and author whose works are available in over 20 countries, including here in Canada, where she's published by the uh, House of Anansi Press. She, Melanie Rabe, she began her working life actually as a journalist um, and secretly at night, she wrote books. And her first novel uh, was published in 2015. It's called The Trap. And it was published in more than 20 countries and became an international bestseller. And it was followed by three different, uh, three other novels like um, The Stranger Upstairs in 2016, The Shadow in 2018, and The Woods in 2019. The Shadow actually, the third novel spent 18 weeks on one of the most important German news magazines bestseller list in 2018 when it came out. Yeah. Canadian, um, and more recently, um, and the German embassy is very proud of it, uh, she joined nine other German writers and 10 Canadian writers in a special pro project, an ebook entitled 20 on 2020, published by Simon & Schuster Canada and created in partnership with the German Embassy here in Ottawa, the Canadian Embassy in Berlin, and the German Culture Institute, Goethe Institute in Montreal. And uh, the ebook is available um, for free online, and we will include that link in the chat. Uh, Melanie currently, Melanie Rabe currently lives in Cologne, and I'd just like to welcome Melanie now, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are very happy to having you here today. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Um, maybe I should start. Um, I just mentioned that you live in Cologne right now. However, you were born in East Germany and spent several years as a child in the German Democratic Republic, uh, like myself, before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Maybe you can just uh, tell us a little bit how it was like to grow up in East Germany, maybe also about the transition time uh, before the reunification, after reunification, just your, your personal experiences. Yes, of course, I would love to. Um, I'm from a very small village in, um, um, in the eastern part of Germany. And I must say, um, as a child, I wasn't really aware of how oppressive the system was that I was growing up in. I was just from a village, growing up with family, climbing trees and being really just a really free roaming kid, <laughs> having a lot of fun with my friends. But I remember um, my parents telling me and my brother not to mention 
certain things at school, like us watching Western television at home and reading Western books and listening to certain kinds of music. I remember that. And I remember um, being in touch with um, socialist um, opinions at school and being, um, I don't want to say indoctrinated because it was really small, but I remember that. But we left um, the um, we left right after the wall came down in eighty nine and went to um, the western part of Germany where I grew up from the age of eight or nine and I went to school there. So I have a very broad German upbringing in the eastern part and in the western part. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, but maybe um, your upbringing, uh, knowing both uh, Germanys, um, I just would be very, very interested to know, did, did it influence or does it still influence your, your literature, uh, how you write, about what you write? Maybe. For me, um, from my own head, from my own mind, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell why I am writing the way I'm writing. Of course, some, some things are deliberately, but some things are just coming up from my own psyche and my subconscious. But I feel like I have an understanding of very different perspectives. And that might be because of moving at a very formative age from a country that was very different um, to another country that um, it was it was really mind boggling to go from um, to go from DDR, the socialist country to um, to a much more capitalist society with big supermarkets and the freedom to travel everywhere. And, and I see all those subtle differences in the people, because it's um, I think the German experience is very distinct and there are elements that apply to both parts, even though we don't really have those two parts anymore. Um, so I think all Germans are share common experiences and um, share common culture and a very rich culture, but I think East and West, and, and this is probably a very unpopular opinion, but I think um, they're still very different. And of course, I have still a lot of relatives in the Eastern parts and, um, and the, the look at the world is different, which is super interesting. And it might be possible that this is um, finding its way into my work by osmosis, but I'm not really aware of it. So it's oh, more, thank you. more a subconscious thing, yeah. Yeah, but very interesting. Thank you very much. Maybe we sometimes underestimate uh, early life experiences and, and the long history of two different uh, Germanys. Um, maybe coming back to your literature, um, when did you know that you wanted to write for a living? I mean, maybe it, it's not a very, I imagine, it's not a very easy decision to decide. Uh, I want to do it for a living. I really want to uh, to earn uh, the salary, and because it's it's very free, but at the same time can be very uncertain. Yes, that's true. Um, I wasn't as brave as deciding to become a writer right after school. I wasn't as brave as that, and I wasn't really thinking about that. But I always loved writing, and I always loved to read. So when I was a child, I always went to the library and I came home with huge bags full of books. And that was my world when I was a kid. And um, I always did well at writing at school and I studied literature after school. And I decided to become a journalist um, for print magazines and newspapers because for some reason, it was always my dream to become a real author and write novels, but I didn't really dare to make that move early on because, well, I'm a working class kid and um, for some reason, I didn't think this would be possible for me. 
I don't know. I didn't that I didn't really dare to try. So I was always writing, and I was writing short stories and um, terrible poetry when I was a teenager. <laughs> and um, and I started to write uh, novels and and longer longer form um, prose when I was in my early twenties. But for a very long time, I just did that for myself, and I didn't even show that to my friends. I just wrote my novels. Um, very quietly and very happily for a time, just for myself. But at a certain point, I thought I might try showing this to publishing houses. And when they all rejected me four times in a row with four different novels, then I made up my mind to make it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, so I put, um, I was working as a journalist by day and writing my novels at night. And I just kept handing them in, handing them in until I had the idea for The Trap, which is my official debut novel, but the fifth novel I've written because the other four have been unpublished to this day. And um, that's when I decided to, to make this a job and not to go back to journalism, but to, to make this a job. And this is corny, but live that dream. But that's very, uh, for me, it's very nice uh, to, to hear uh, that people still there live their dreams it's very important and it shows you have a lot of perseverance and i admire it i have to say i um love your your novels as well because i i love uh, thrillers and um you write thrillers and i would be um really interested uh, to know why did you decide to write thrillers is it because you like it because it's, it's easier to write or whatever uh, whatever you think about it yeah, it took me a while to, um, to realize that this was the genre for me, because um, when I started out writing quietly at home, never showing my, my texts to anyone, I was, the first novel I've written was a classic coming of age novel. And what I really like about writing thrillers is um, the means of suspense. I just love surprises and mysteries and, and cliffhangers and surprising twists. And I started out experimenting with that. And it was just, it just developed that way in, in a very organic fashion. And I always try to follow the ideas that are coming up. And I think when I first had the idea for, for my first thriller, and I write psychological thrillers that are not very bloody, there's not much, much violence or gore, it's mostly about, there's always a mystery, a secret at the core, and we really want to find out what is happening. Um, at least that's, that's always my plan. And at a certain point, I realized that it's really fun to create interesting characters that could inhabit any novel, not just a thriller, and, um, and to, to, to create something about topics that are um, very universal, but do that with the means of a thriller. And at a certain time, I found my own niche doing that. And um, so it, it wasn't the plan, it just happened that way. At first, I really saw myself writing just general literary novels. But um, yeah, it, it's just really fun to, um, to think about a story and make it as compelling and as gripping and as um, entertaining as possible while still giving it some depth. And I just like this combination between um, literature and entertainment. It's really, really fun. Thank you, nice to hear. Maybe uh, now we, we, we are talking a lot about uh, your novels. Maybe you could just um, read a little excerpt uh, from, from one of your novels to us, to. a very short one. Yes, Thank you. very short. Um, I've chosen the beginning of uh, my third novel, The Shadow, 
um, which is set in Vienna, in Austria, but begins um, at, at a completely different setting in, uh, in February, which is fitting. She would simply disappear. The ice would crack and give way beneath her feet and she'd be pulled swiftly under. No flailing and thrashing to stay above water, no struggle, just down, down, down into the darkness and silence. When she was little, she had often walked on the frozen pond that lay between the edge of town and the fields. It didn't occur to her back then that it was possible to fall through. To think that such a place existed, a small lake in the middle of the wood, overhung by trees, their branches weighed down by snow as if they were mourning. The tips of her fingers were numb, her toes so cold that they hurt. She swung the torch to and fro. There was nobody here but her. They hadn't come, and yet there were tracks. Had she missed them? Was she late? She glanced at her watch. No, she wasn't. She switched off the torch. Inching her way along the forest path, she had needed the grainy beam of light, but now that she'd stepped out from the shadowy trees, she could do without it. The stars were bright out here, far from the city. Frosty leaves crunched underfoot. The night glistened. For a moment, she forgot what she was doing here in the middle of the night, forgot about the betrayal and the anger and the pain. She stepped out onto the frozen surface, stopped, listened. The ice creaked, a living being stirring in a dream. She listened more closely, looked up at the sky, closed her eyes. The silence sang in her ears. Strange, she thought. Wind got up, sharp as a knife and smelling of fresh snow. She hunched her shoulders. The stars gleamed milkily. She had the feeling she shouldn't be here. Then she saw something on the ice. She hesitated, stooping to get a better look at whatever it was. She reached out hand to it. When she realized what she was looking at, she recoiled. A dead bird, dark against the white snow, not yet frozen. She stiffened and turned away abruptly, breathing fast. She believed in signs. There was nobody there. She wheeled around, nothing, nobody, just her and the night. She looked up at the stars again. Then she made up her mind. She would do it. She would destroy them, all of them. But the one she really wanted to destroy was Nora. Thank you very much. Very fascinating and very exciting. <laughs> it makes you really want to read uh, this is, uh, the novel. This is the right of, uh, of the shadow and, um, and the, the mentioned character of Nora. Um, who is going to be destroyed by, um, by the person speaking here is the main protagonist of the story. So this is why um, this is exciting in the, in the chapters coming. <laughs> I don't want to go into, into detail uh, about the book because uh, maybe uh, I'm hopefully a lot of people would like to read it and we don't yes. want to destroy fun no, about it. Less. But um, as a person living in, 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 in Cologne and, and uh, having grown up in the East, is there any special reason why you set up a story like this in Vienna? Yes, yes, there is. Um, actually, I, when I was plotting The Shadow, I was thinking about writing um, a, a psychological thriller in, in the fashion of, um, of a ghost story, of an old fashioned, almost Victorian mystery. Um, and I was traveling quite a bit at the time. And um, I was on book tour in, in all of Europe. And I went to Prague and I went to Vienna. And both cities are beautiful, but both cities have some 
um, dark, macabre elements to them, I feel. And so I was thinking about setting uh, the novel in, in one of those cities. And at a certain point, wandering the streets of Vienna um, before, um, before a book event I was doing there um, in February, when this beautiful city was empty because it was freezing cold and nobody was out in the streets and everybody was bundled up. And, um, and I was uh, wandering the streets and looking at all the small alleyways and and I came to um, I came to Prata, which is um, a big area, big historic area, with a huge Ferris wheel and um, and place. It's like a, it's like an histor like a historic amusement park in Vienna. And I thought this is a wonderful place to have a showdown of a thriller in it. And so I decided on Vienna. And I felt the atmosphere is really, um, is really becoming for that kind of literature because there's so much history, there's so much, um, there's so much in the air. And, um, and it's a cliche, but in Europe, you're probably aware we say that um, the, the Viennese have a tendency to be a bit drawn to everything um, that's a bit dark and a bit macabre. <laughs> so I thought. That's true. <laughs> I mean, uh, the cliche might not be true, but it's true that we are saying it. Yes. I know it. I'm familiar with it. Okay, thank you for sharing this. And it shows definitely uh, that you have a lot of creativity. Um, it's what you usually expect uh, of a writer, but uh, what may be a little bit more unusual is that you took to, to writing a book about creativity. I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, maybe it never um, came into my mind that you could write about, um, about something that usually comes out of your personality. Well, you can do it, but writing a Usually you write a book and that shows your creativity, but writing about creativity is a completely different thing. Um, why, why would it be, or was it so important for you to write about creativity? Yeah, that really just happened. Um, I was having a podcast for, for a very long time with a friend of mine, Laura Kampf, who is a very well-known designer in Germany. And she's, she's uh, designing and building stuff with her own hands. And um, she's in Cologne too. And um, we're old friends from school, actually, from a small town I was growing up in. And we are both rather creative, but in totally different fields. I'm doing very abstract work writing for maybe two years until I have a finished novel and she's building stuff and putting it out constantly in her, and she has her workshop and she's uh, working with materials, with wood and, uh, and metals and so on. And um, we had this little ritual to, to meet up in a uh, in lunch break in a cafe to talk about her work. And we, we realized that we work very similarly and have similar problems, even though we are doing completely different kinds of work. And um, at a certain point, we thought that these conversations we are having about inspiration, about productivity, about um, forms of creativity blocks, like writer's block or the kind of blocks she was experiencing and all those topics about surrounding creativity, that it might be interesting for, um, for other people to listen in on us. And so we decided to start this podcast and we were talking once a week about everything creativity. And um, once my publishing house caught wind of that, <laughs> they asked me because they thought we were talking about this topic in a very fresh and um, non-pretentious way. Um, they asked me whether I would be happy to, to write a book about it. And I must say, I always wanted to do that. And I was thinking about doing that because creativity is a topic I'm fascinated with. And, um, but I thought um, at first I would probably do that when I'm 80 and wise, but, <laughs> but then I thought, why not do it now? Because um, the main thesis of my book, and I've written uh, and I've and I've read very many books about creativity. Um, the main thesis is that creativity is not just for writers or artists 
um, but it's for everybody because we're all creative. It's just something our brain is doing when it's solving a problem and you can um, you can apply it to practically anything and um, you can do practically anything um, in a in normal ordinary way or in a rather creative way and you can decide when 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 it's your best friend's birthday you can go and buy her flowers or you can go and um, pick her some flowers or you can draw her flowers and um, when you're cooking you can go by recipe or you can just make something up from the things you have in your fridge. And I decided to do this book because I realized that very many books about creativity are very technical, which is interesting. And in my book, there's um, there are many techniques as well. But I decided to go a different route to talk about my creative way and all of my failures and what I learned along the way. So um, it was really fun to write and I learned um, and I myself learned a lot about creativity while I was writing it. And it was my first nonfiction book and, um, and a bit of going back to my old journalist ways, which was really, really nice too for a change. What, a, what an uplifting thought. I mean, we in our everyday working lives, we tend to forget that uh, we can creative in very small things as well. So Ray, thanks for reminding us. And coming back to, to the topic of Black History Month. And um, I just uh, would like to know, um, I would like to ask you for your impressions. What is it like to be a Black writer and podcaster today in Germany? It's interesting times, actually, because um, when I was growing up, um, I mean, maybe I should say at first, um, for people who haven't been to Germany yet, there are not as many Black people here. It's not like Canada or the US. It's, um, we, we are here, we've been here for a long time, but we're not that many. So growing up, I used to be um, the only Black person in the room, usually in the classroom, studying at work. But um, during the last years and during the last decades, um, the communities have become much more visible. The black communities in Germany have become much more visible in media, in art, and um, which is um, in big part thanks to um, what we call Initiative Schwarze Deutsche. It's an initiative of black Germans who've come together to raise awareness of our history and what we're doing in our communities and how we're trying to make a change in Germany. And um, they actually were the ones that started um, Black History Month in Germany in the 90s, which wasn't um, perceived very broadly um, up until maybe the last couple of years. But in the last couple of years, there have been um, different um, authors, inter black authors, intellectuals and, um, and celebrities in Germany that have been very successfully bringing this awareness into the mainstream and have been going to the big talk shows in the country and having um, have written best-selling books about the topic. So this is really changing. And um, being a black author in Germany for me sometimes means just just being an author without any consider consideration for um, skin color, which is nice for a change too. And it can mean to be um, invited um, for, um, for an event and preparing for a literary event and then realizing that you're just there because you're the black author, which can be nice and can be very, um, but can be also be very um, annoying because sometimes you just want to be there for the work. And sometimes there's a nice combination of both. And um, it's interesting times because I think a lot is changing um, in the right direction, but for Germany, there's still a long way to go. And when I'm looking at the newspapers during Black History Month or scrolling through my feed on Instagram, I see a lot about it, but as soon as I'm going out of my tiny filter bubble of um, 
of people who read a lot and travel a lot and are very diverse. Um, I, I run into people instantly who don't even know what Black History Month is and what it's for. So long way to go in Germany. Yeah, and that's interesting because um, when I came to Canada, it's my first uh, Black History Month in Canada. Um, I realized it's, um, it's much more, um, people are much more aware of it. It's more widespread. You can see documentaries, uh, films, and so on, on, on TV. You can read a lot about it on social media, in, on, on, on the newspapers. And um, I assume, um, having, having, having listened to you, um, could Canada, uh, bringing it a little bit more in focus in Germany as well, could Canada be a role model or a model for Germany um, in this case? Do you think so? Yes, I think so. Yes. And I think it probably is because um, some, some magazines, some newspapers are picking this up and I think they are modeling it after countries like Canada. This is just, I can't prove that, but um, that's my feeling. And um, I think that's a good thing because obviously it works. Um, and why not remodel something that works? Yeah, sounds very good to me. Um, just the last question maybe, what, at least for me, uh, what are you um, planning to do in the future? Do you have any ideas about new novels, anything else? whatever. Yes, I do. <laughs> I have many ideas for new novels, always writing notes down. I just finished a new novel, which will come out in the fall in Germany. And I'm very looking forward to it. I hope that um, that the Corona, the COVID situation will allow us to have a big book fair in Frankfurt this year in the fall. And um, I will be presenting the new novel there. Um, I'm in talks with a lot of uh, movie folks um, that we've sold a couple of my novels to. And so I'm dipping a little toe into this world right now. And, um, and I'll also be writing a new nonfiction book about oh. another topic. It's not about creativity. It's something else entirely. But um, that's what I'm going to be doing next after I finished the novel. And um, the novel just takes some, some last corrections and then it's finished. Oh, thank, God. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It was really nice. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm coming to the, the questions from our listeners, uh, the audience uh, today. And uh, I'll start with... Um, you spoke about inspiration. Um, what is yours? What is your inspiration? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, my inspiration, my main inspiration is other people. I'm, um, I'm in fact a rather shy person, but I love people. And I love talking to, um, to people I meet in waiting in line at the post office. I love talking to people on trains. Um, yesterday I was in a taxi and we got in a big, um, uh, there was the rush hour and we were stuck. And I spoke to the taxi driver who was lovely and really, really interesting. And of course there are always different sources of inspiration like nature. I always have good ideas in nature and um, other arts. I love books, obviously, but um, when I'm not feeling well, I'm feeling stuck, I go to one of the museums around and just look at beautiful, beautiful art. And, um, and I love music and I love listening to music when I'm writing because um, that always does something very productive to my head. But my main inspiration is other people. I love people. I've never met a dull person in my life, really. Wow, <laughs> that sounds really cool. Um, next question, uh, what is your advice to people who feel they have something to write about, uh, but can't get to it? Maybe because they are too shy. You just mentioned you are shy as well. No. However, you like talking to people, so maybe other people are too shy uh, doing it. So what would be your advice? Yeah, 
if you think you have something to tell, you are right. That's, uh, I just want to say that <laughs> in advance. Um, I think my advice, if you're having problems um, to get to it because you don't, you feel you don't have the time is to um, just take baby steps and write in your lunch break or write 15 minutes when you get home from work and just, just let that be enough and develop things slowly, which can make for a very rich story. Um, and, and the shyness aspect of it, if you have to talk to people for a book or for something you want to write, in my experience, it makes it much easier. Um, I was a good journalist, even though I was so shy, because when I was out for a story, when I was sent somewhere to interview someone, you have your in, you have your, your reason to talk to them, to approach people. So if you want to write a story, if you want to write an article, an essay, whatever, take that as the reason to approach people. It's, it's a wonderful icebreaker to interview someone. Um, and yeah, that would be my advice to just really um, do it because I'm very passionate about, especially about people who say, they're rather shy and they're not sure whether they have something to share or are allowed to do that. Um, because I think it would be, um, the world would be so much richer if not just the bold people were sharing what's in their heads, but the shy people too, because we need all kinds of perspectives and that's a kind of diversity as well. So um, whoever's thinking about writing something should do so, and we live in wonderful times where you can just share things with the world without having to have a publishing house that um, is printing things for you. You can put stuff out yourself, which is amazing, I think. Thank you. I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. We are having, uh, we have a live question right now. Please unmute yourself, uh, unmute, unmute yourself if you like and ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, v Gates, Melanie. Oh, hi. I am, <laughs> I am, I am, I am in California. And I'm <clears throat> I especially uh, excited to know about you. And I'm on your second book, The Stranger. It's, you're, you blow my mind. But I also want to say our connections, a little, I also speak German. Um, my uh, my stepmother was Czechoslovakian, but she was in the work camps during the war. Wow. And um, uh, so when my father married her, she, German was always spoken when I was there. I am especially, and I lived for a short while in Germany too. I am especially um, interested in the connections, if there's any connections or uh, liaisons between um, Black American and Black Germans that you know of, any, any groups that are very active, because I would like to very much stay in touch and also improve my German. <laughs> and, uh, um, um, are there any at all? Do you know of? I, I know of, of personal relationships, but not of, of a big... Um, union between Afro-German and Af African-American groups. But I think a good, um, a good point to start would be um, the initiative, I, I don't know how to say it in English, Initiative Schwarze Deutsche, ESD. Um, they're like the, the, biggest, um, the biggest union of black people in Germany. And they might very well be aware of um, of what you're looking for. And um, that's a good question. I never looked that up, but um, I'm sure it exists and I just haven't found it yet, but I'm sure it exists. It Thank you, does. I will look up. And also I'm, as a writer, I'm very excited about your work and just wanted to know, can you speak a little bit on your writing process? Yes. That's my yeah, last question, okay. thank you. And it's always oh, nice to have other writers, by the way, so. That's great. Um, my writing process is, um, it's, it's a bit different from book to book, but there's some things that, that never change. I love to write in the morning. 
this is my most important time. And this is because I used to be a journalist and work by day in, in different jobs. And I only had the very early morning to write. And um, when I was still having all my other jobs, I was writing at four in the morning, maybe five for a couple of hours. Um, now I sleep in a bit longer, but I still get right to, to work. And I just need a cup of tea. I have a writing playlist. Sometimes I write just in silence, but I have a writing playlist. And what is very important to me when I'm really producing text, and not just like um, doing, doing corrections or something, is to be as undisturbed as possible because, um, yeah, because my mind wanders. <laughs> and um, so I actually have an app to shut down the internet and to shut down everything on my computer and, and get really focused. And when I'm starting to write a new novel, um, I usually pick up one, one premise, one core idea that's interesting me, that just sticks. And I wander around with that in the back of my mind and my notebook with me and just collect things, bits and bobs that don't really fit together for a couple of weeks. And then I go and write an expose, like two or three pages, what I think the story might be about. And then I hand that in to my publishing house so they know what I'm doing. And, um, and then I just write and I don't make um, huge plans for every chapter. What I know are the main characters when I start out writing. I know the main characters. I know the premise, the heart of the novel, and I know what the end might be. So um, like, um, like, like a safety net. I know what the end might be. And then I just start writing and I try to, um, to have a very free process and to just to just write to the end like the first draft my first draft is super messy because I'm not trying to do it perfectly because I would never finish if I were trying to write everything perfectly perfectly in the first draft I'm just trying to tell the story to myself and once I've done that I have something to work with and then I'm, um, I'm taking things out and polishing things and moving things around. And then I have a second draft and I usually need four or five or sometimes six or seven drafts until I feel now this is alive and now this is worth to be read by something other than me. And then I hand it in and then my, um, my editor, who is amazing by the way, um, then she, she's reading and um, giving me feedback. And then we're polishing some more. And at some point we have a novel, but it's a very long process. And it's, um, it's a sometimes messy process because I'm not one of the writers who know everything in advance and plot everything out in their minds before they start writing. I'm not doing that. So that's my process. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have another question. It's a very nice one, actually. I mean, our questions are very good, but um, it's a complimentary one. Uh, do you do your own translation, um, as somebody wants to know, or do you comment on the translation of your books? Do you feel that you can contrib contribute to this aspect? I'm asking because your English is almost perfect, uh, better than most Germans. English. <laughs> That's really nice. Very kind. Thank you so much. I was very nervous about speaking English because I don't travel anymore because of COVID. <laughs> um, I have a very, very good um, translator. Her, her name is Imogen Rose Taylor. She's British and she lives in Berlin. And when she first started working with me, we met and um, she translated three of my novels to date. And she's very um, collaborative. Um, she's doing her thing, obviously, but when she's unsure about, um, about something, about one aspect, about one word, she will sometimes call me and ask, um, what do you think is, is the right one here? What's the right adjective here, for example? Because, um, German is, of course, a rich language, but in English, there are much more um, 
much more choices to be made about how to phrase something. Um, I think uh, the English dictionary is, um, um, is just, you just have much more words in English to say something, to express something. So sometimes you have to make a decision and um, because in German we have one word and in English there are five that will be possible. And she's talking to me about things like that to, to get it just right. And I think she's really brilliant because for me, when I'm writing, I not only think about um, about plot and content and style, but also about rhythm. I love it when, um, when language has a certain rhythm to it when you're reading it. And obviously it's really hard to, um, to transfer that to another language because um, especially English in contrast to German is much more precise and, and short and quick. And um, my English novels are usually, the English translations are, the books are much thinner because in German it takes um, much more room to say something. Um, but having said that, Imogen is, is really good at even um, imitating uh, the rhythm of my German sentences. So I feel this doesn't really read like a translation. It reads like it just has been written that way. And that's thanks to her. She's really good. I'm very lucky to have her. Do you know uh, by any chance in how many languages uh, your books are translated? Um, I think about 20, um, maybe 22. I need to count, but I think about 20. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And unfortunately, English is the only one I can contribute to when, uh, when, the, when the translator is asking me things because I speak a little bit of French and a tiny bit of Spanish and Italian, but not well enough to, to help the translator out in any way. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, maybe just um, as time is, is running out, um, quite too fast, I would say. Um, I'd like to know, and I have another question. Um, you mentioned that uh, you thought coming from a working class family and having your background in mind, it might be too difficult or too hard to, to have success. Did it ever come to your mind that being a black woman in Germany um, uh, or for a black woman in Germany, it might be difficult uh, to have success uh, in this country? Or was it just your background as a working family? For some reason, I was thinking more, or oh, oh no, I, I guess I didn't even say that right. Um, this wasn't a conscious thought. I didn't think... Um, I can't be an author because I'm coming from a working class family, but it was much more, it, div it didn't even occur to me that it would be, would be an option to become an author because okay. of my background. So because I was in, in very, um, at my home, an amazing home with a lot of books, there wasn't, um, there weren't discussions about literature and I didn't know any authors or journalists or academics for that matter. That just wasn't the world I grew up in. So it took me a while to, um, to find the people that were interested in, th in the same things that I was interested in, like literature and academics and all those things. So um, it sounds strange. Um, in hindsight, but it just didn't occur to me. And it wasn't, it wasn't really about um, the color of my skin or other people's perception of me, but it was about my own perception of myself. And um, once I got that right and thought, oh, by the way, I can do whatever I please, <laughs> um, then um, I didn't feel I actually never felt that it, what, it was a problem that, I, that I'm a black author. Um, I was probably very lucky to be working with the agents and publishers I have been working with, who've all been very supportive and they just give me money to work and let me write whatever I want, which is amazing. Thank you. And thank you, Melanie. And thank you to, um, to the audience for prioritizing the beauty of, liter of literature and the importance of Black History Month, especially on such a difficult day as, as it is today. 
And uh, I just like to mention that our event will be available online. So please make use um, of the link in the chat to sign up uh, for our newsletter. We will have a lot of uh, more events coming up in the future. And uh, you might just like to, uh, to join um, one or another event. And thank you again, Melanie. It was really fun having you here. Very encouraging. Thank you so much. That was really fun. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And thanks everybody for watching. This was a treat for me. Thank you. Goodbye to everyone. Thank you.